And now I'm going to introduce our speakers. You'll recognize a lot of them by their byline or their television appearances. Uh, and you have their biographies in your program. So uh, these introductions will be short and sweet. Uh, I do want to mention that Greta Van Susteren was not able to join us today because of a family matter. Uh, but Chris Buzzkirk uh, has kindly switched from the legal panel to this panel because he also publishes and edits a blog. So he could uh, go either way, as they say. So <laughs> we're, we're happy to have him join us. Uh, now, beginning to uh, my right and your left is Peter Baker, the chief White House correspondent of the New York Times. Next is Margaret Taleb, senior White House correspondent for Bloomberg News and the president of the White House Correspondents Association. Next to Margaret is Major Garrett, chief White House correspondent of CBS News and the host of the podcast, The Takeout, and I should also say a proud graduate of the Missouri School whoop, of whoop. Journalism. <laughs> Continuing to my left is Clarence Page, the Pulitzer Prize winning columnist for the Chicago Tribune and a regular panelist on the newly revived McLaughlin Group. Next to Clarence is Chris Buzzkirk, publisher and editor of American Greatness, who's written commentary for the Washington Post and has been uh, interviewed regularly on NPR, PBS, and CNN. And next to Chris is Hadas Gold, a reporter for CNN who covers the media and politics. And last and certainly not least is Dan Balls, the chief correspondent of the Washington Post. Please welcome up the panel. As you can see, we have assembled what at least one television host would call a powerhouse panel. These are journalists who have years of experience covering many administrations and who are going to take us behind the scenes today to tell us what it's really like to report on Washington today. We'll have time for uh, questions at the end uh, from our audience here and uh, on Facebook Live. At last year's Hurley Symposium, we gathered a similar group of journalists who seem to still be in shock at the changes that had come with the Trump administration. There were fears of a loss of access, a clamp down on information, and lurking in the background, threats of leak investigations and defamation lawsuits. And on top of that, the President of the United States early on declared the news media to be the enemies of the people who didn't have the country's best interests at heart. So I want to find out now, a year later, a year and four months later, what uh, the situation is like, how people are seeing things, and how it has evolved from those on, uh, who are on the ground covering this city and this administration every day. But I want to begin with Margaret, who's, the, as I said before, is the president of the White House Correspondents Association, because Margaret, you made a little news this morning. Tell us. <laughs> Uh, I was telling Barbara, actually, we just were the bystanders of a little bit of news and then had to respond to it. Um, the uh, president announced on a radio program uh, that he does not intend to attend this year's dinner. Uh, while I was on the phone with the White House discussing how we would roll out that decision, so bypassed our <laughs> message machine. Um, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> Not yet, yes. Uh, but it is Friday. It, well, that's true, right. Somebody, hopefully it won't be me, it still could be. Um, uh, but I'll tell you, there is something a little bit different about their posture, the administration's posture this year. The White House telling us that while the president himself uh, doesn't feel comfortable attending this year, he is going to actively encourage his, uh, his cabinet, his advisors, the executive branch who have received invitations to attend that dinner, which, as you know, is a celebration of the First Amendment. Uh, the press secretary, Sarah Sanders, will join us at the head table, which is a traditional position for uh, a White House press secretary. So uh, although the um, radio message was, well, you know what it was. I'm not going to repeat it. Uh, the um, message underscoring it is uh, one of participation uh, this year. and. I think that's a good thing. Right. How's that for a measured response? That, that, <laughs> very very presidential. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, Peter, let's uh, let's go to you. Uh, you have uh, 
you've covered a number of administrations, um, and I described those early days. Uh, Elizabeth Bumiller, your bureau chief, was here last year to describe what was going on. How has it evolved in, uh, for you and your colleagues at the New York Times? Well, it's a great question. You know, there's this, there is, as you talked about at the beginning, this sort of um, rhetoric of hostility, you know, enemy of the people, uh, obviously. Our good friend Dan's uh, paper is in the crosshairs this last week in particular. From time to time, obviously, we are. Um, but in the White House itself, in the briefing room, in the day in, day out uh, business, it sort of settled down from the early days when we weren't sure whether we were going to be kicked out of the building, whether we were going to even have briefings anymore, whether they might be televised or not. Every day, major will remember, why are we going to have today? Is this going to be on television, not television, cameras or not? That kind of thing has settled down. That kind of sort of day in, day out confrontation has now evolved into a more or less, uh, more or less regular rhythm. That doesn't mean that we don't have our issues. Obviously, we do. Um, but in terms of the day in, day out business of, of, of uh, working with the White House, it's, it's, it's sort of settled into a more of a regular routine. Major, uh, our other White House correspondent here, let's uh, continue. What's, sure. what's it like uh, for you? And, and you, too, have covered past ad sure. uh, administrations. So, so what's important to understand is that uh, much of the president's combative nature with the media in the last six to eight months has been mostly theatrical and not practical or legal. No one's been accused of anything. There have been no attempts to get phone records. Uh, I should remind you the previous administration did both. We should not forget that. So this administration has, through the president, and only really through the president, maybe a cabinet secretary will sometimes make an aside about fake news or something, but the concentrated dialogue comes from one person and one person only, the president of the United States. And it has been primarily, and in a practical sense at the building, theatrical. Now, the other things have come with this administration that are worth noting. We have fewer briefings week in and week out, and they are of much shorter duration. Sarah Sanders' briefings now clock about 20 minutes, which is demonstrably shorter than most previous press secretaries would much brief. Much shorter than the Obama administration. Yeah, no, I'm not saying you need an hour and a half. Uh, <laughs> but they're much shorter. And uh, if you subtract the scheduling that Sarah will go through, which all of us in the room already know. We know what the president did. We know what he's going to do, generally speaking. It can be as few as 15 minutes of actual questions and answers. And that constrains what the public sees and hears, asked of the White House and answered by the White House. And on a week-to-week -week basis, there may be three briefings. This week, we'll have two on camera. Most other White Houses would have at least four. Um, and yet. This president, unlike President Obama, certainly is much more willing to engage with the White House reporters on a give and take basis informally and generate a tremendous amount of news. Uh, and at that level, access to this president and the ability to check in with him, and I'd much rather check in with him than the press secretary any day, to check in with him and get his thinking on a range of issues is more frequent and, uh, and certainly more news making than President Obama. He, President Obama had no inclination really to do that. He would do it on occasion when he would sort of be talked into it, but it wasn't his preferred method of communication. It's quite clearly this president's preferred method of communication, and all of us have had to adapt to that. So we now have a much more elaborate way of covering a departure or arrival of this president. Far more people are out on the South Lawn with far more microphones and cameras because you never know when President Trump is just gonna walk up and talk to you for 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. Same thing in, ca in cabinet rooms or uh, in the Oval Office. And I know my colleagues who carry ca heavy cameras on their shoulders for a living have had to reimagine what they do because when you're standing there with that camera for an hour, as t two different pool cameramen have had to in the last four months, and that frame shot has to be solid, because you need it to be solid, you need it not to move, and you, you can't bend your knees and stretch your back. It changes the way you approach your day-to-day -day job. So there have been adaptations to the way this president rolls. He rolls in a very different way. And those around him in the communication shop roll in a different way. They take almost every one of their cues from him, usually retroactively. 
there is very little pre-planning and then execution of whatever that pre-planned approach was. And we've all had to adapt to that reality. Margaret, I want to return to you to talk a, a little more about the substance of covering the White House, and uh, and that's exactly what I want to know. We, you see him a lot. What's the quality of information you're getting? Uh, well, I would say on the one hand, the quality of the information is um, it's kind of in a much purer, or more concentrated form when you hear it straight from the horse's mouth, particularly when it's like off the cuff, and uh, oftentimes like it will be. Um, almost like an emotionally driven decision to react. So he spoke to reporters on the plane yesterday. That wasn't planned, it wasn't scheduled, but he'd had an exceptionally good rally in West Virginia and I think was feeling really good about the crowd feedback and also wanted to defend his uh, EPA administrator who's come under fire for Airbnb <laughs> rates and such. Uh, and uh, so nobody really knows why he came back, but I think that's probably why he came back. And so you have to kind of always be ready. And he covered a lot of ground, everything from Stormy Daniels to Pruitt to a lot of substance in between. Um, but the a kind of parallel question is uh, if you like to cover policy, because every White House is a mix of covering politics and policy and where the two intersect and what's possible under the political climate and all that sort of stuff, right? So <clears throat> the three of us, we come from kind of a policy background. We like politics, it's interesting, but we like to write about foreign policy, about domestic policy. Uh, it's harder to cover policy in this administration because the policy is more fungible, I would say. Um, and uh, you might um, try to do a really deep dive on what the Syria policy is, and the Syria policy might change. Uh, from the time you begin reporting the story in, until after, or at least the explanation. I'm not trying to. I'm like I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm. I'm being serious. Like it's, it's. Um, Obama was almost like painfully careful. You'd be like, just tell us what you think, and he didn't want to say something unless he really knew what he was thinking. But but once you were able to extricate what the position was, that was pretty much the position, and you didn't hear three or four different versions of it. He wouldn't normally change once he was on a certain course. And, and this is different. And so um, both the ability to write a consistent policy story that sticks and the ability to uh, find the airspace for the policy stories when there's so many more colorful personality stories popping has created a real challenge for the reporters like us who don't necessarily trade in, in palace intrigue or or the, the pure politics of, of White House coverage as, as an art form. It's, it's kind of changed the balance of that. Um, and so we've all had to <clears throat> become a little more um, like TMZ in what we do. And it's not, it's not really like my brand. So I'm, you know, but it's, it's good for all of us to expand our boundaries. Um, <laughs> but so there, you know, so there's that. Uh, but I do think in terms of, um, being able to distill or capture, capture the essence of a moment, that that is, um, there's a lot more opportunity for that. I do think there's value in it, but, but it's where the rubber meets the road. It's what the president's thinking at a given moment and how that translates into governance. Um, that part is, um, I think we're still learning that and I think the administration is still learning that. Um, <clears throat> and it is only like, what is it, 14 or 15 months in, but it feels like a lot longer than that, so it feels like, <laughs> It feels like this should already be a well-worn path and we should have a better sense of how the moment translates into governance, but I think, uh, but we don't yet. We have a phrase at the end of every week at the White House. What a young, long year this week has been. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of like dog years, right? Yes. Uh, let's widen out the lens. Uh, Dan Balls, you uh, cover politics writ large, so you've been out talking to people beyond the beltway, both. Uh, politicians and uh, voters. Uh, what are you seeing and what are they telling you, uh, and let's just focus on what are they telling you about how they view the president's uh, denunciations of the press and what kind of job they think the press is doing in covering this president? Well, I, I think that, you know, in terms of the day-to-day -day coverage of the White House, which the three people you've just talked or heard from um, are living that moment inside the bubble day in, day out. 
And there has become a kind of a regularization of that. Um, I won't necessarily say normalization because this is still the most unusual presidency we've seen in many, many years. Um, but there are ways in which people have learned to work together um, in a relatively productive way. If you pull back from that, I think that when you think about this president, um, it, is, it is true that he, he remains at war with the press writ large um, and with the things that we have, we have always tried to do um, as journalists and as reporters. And when you talk to people around the country, there is a clear division um, on that issue as well as almost everything else having to do with Donald Trump. Um, there's no doubt that he has been pretty successful in delegitimizing a lot of what the, what, however you want to call it, the mainstream media or traditional media or whatever you want to call it, uh, what organizations like ours and, and others represented here on the, on the stage have d always done. And so there is a lot less that we do now that is believed broadly across the country. Uh, if you are a supporter of Donald Trump, you tend not to believe things that the Washington Post publishes or the New York Times publishes or cable news reports. Um, if you are opposed to the president, you tend to kind of cling to those organizations as a way to try to you know, keep the traditions of the First Amendment alive. So um, that division has not lessened. If anything, that division is greater today than it, than it was when he came into office. Um, I think that, that uh, you know, he is, he is quite skillful at that, and it's, it's part of his technique. It's, it's, it's part of the way in which he reinforces the support that he was able to attract. But I think there's, a, there's another question, and that is how well it's going to wear over time. And I think that you can see some cracks. You can, you can see some cracks in the polling, even though his, his approval rating is a little bit higher right now than it has been in the past. Um, and I think that there are a lot of people uh, who are concerned about just the level of chaos that seems to be part of the day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month operation of this administration, and particularly the way he does it. Um, I, there's almost, almost nobody that I've talked to in the last year and going around the country uh, who doesn't wish that his Twitter feed would be shut down or at least quieted on a, on a significant basis. Even his supporters, yes, that's right. I mean, it's, even his supporters find that um, you know, troublesome, annoying, um, and, and unproductive, um, even if they continue to stay with him. So um, the divisions, he, you know, he inherited a divided country. This country is as divided perhaps more so than it was when he came in. Um, and his, his persistent attacks on the press um, have certainly taken a toll. Clarence, uh, you're paid to give people your opinion. Best job in the world. <laughs> um, I got to do what every taxi driver does for free. <laughs> <laughs> and Barbara. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's get your take on this. And you've been here for a while. You and I were both reminiscing about Watergate when we uh, were talking before the panel. How do you compare this to what you've seen over time, and, and uh, what's it like now? Yeah, I think I mentioned, I, I often wonder what uh, Watergate would have been like if Nixon used Twitter. You know, and I mean, just let, just let your minds meditate on that for a moment, <laughs> because uh, you, could th you could think about how much the world has changed for us and everybody else uh, since the 1970s. Uh, and uh, uh, in regard to what Dan was talking about, you know, the, the, uh, what I call the, the retribalization of America is kind of taking hold. There's a, uh, now um, more and more our politics nationally are, are like what I, I'm accustomed to in my early days covering uh, Chicago <laughs> politics. Uh, your political beliefs were defined by what neighborhood you came from, who your friends, who your associations were, what bar you went to to cash your check after you, after you came home from the factory. And uh, now, uh, what, what I'm seeing, I, I'm still reluctant to believe the public uh, hates us any more than they used to. They've always hated us. Uh, and the bearers of bad news, the, the, the messenger gets blamed. Uh, this is a very traditional thing. And I, I, I feel like things have gotten more digital and faster now. 
Uh, Margaret certainly right about the frustrations a lot of us feel now. There's a general exhaustion I find in uh, the, the, the media community as, as I see it in Washington uh, these days because uh, uh, the old what uh, body clock that we used to operate under uh, has fallen apart now. I come from, from the old school days when uh, I would, I would write a couple of columns a week, one Sunday, one Wednesday. Uh, maybe something would come up uh, in between an editorial or something. Uh, now I've been told by my editors, look, forget Sunday, Wednesday. Whenever you finish writing it, just put it online. <laughs> And, and maybe it'll run in, in print uh, a day or two later or something. We just put it online. And, and it's, it's really true. What do you do when uh, uh, a, a story like the, the omnibus, omnibus but, uh, spending bill, which is a big deal, I mean, not just fiscally, but ideologically, you know, a betrayal of the Tea Party and sort of thing, uh, it, it, it gets squeezed in between um, a, a Stormy Daniels and Roseanne. I, I, I mean, this is the way our days are, you know? Mm -hmm. Whatever the next tweet is, that's the new agenda all of a sudden. I can't finish a daggone column without something else coming along about Putin or somebody and just bumps whatever I was working on that was wonderfully important. is isn't even, even in print yet. Uh, this is a, a new day we're dealing with. There's more action on my Twitter feed uh, now, back and forth, uh, than uh, I see in daily press as I traditionally knew it. But everything is changing around us now. And uh, I'm very excited by it, frankly. Uh, I told you before that when President Trump was first elected, uh, I, I was deeply concerned. I'm, I'm on the board of the Committee to Protect Journalists. I've been dealing with press freedoms internationally for years, uh, including the Obama administration's abuses, by the way. You're absolutely right. And uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not so worried after three or four months when, when I began to see how incompetent this administration is. Uh, and maybe it's because I've been covering Chicago politics for so long. Uh, I know how an efficient despot operates. <laughs> I know how autocracy is supposed to work. You, you take care of the folks in the neighborhoods, and then they'll leave you alone to do what you want to do up here. That's happening now, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, when, when I, I go back to uh, my native land of Chicago, or, or where I grew up in southern Ohio in the heart of Trump country, I don't hear people debating the Russia uh, story. Uh, my, my intellectual friends along the lakefront, yeah, they, they, they're uh, talk, talking about the Russia story, but, but, but folks in southern Ohio were concerned about the uh, tariffs on steel uh, and uh, you know, uh, bringing jobs back, like jobs I know ain't coming back like, like the coal mines or whatever, but it's, it's very much more bread and butter out there and uh, the kind of things that occupy our days. And, and I mean, I'm thrilled to cover every bit of Russia <laughs> story, bring me more. But I also know that only a certain portion of my readers really care about that compared to Stormy Daniels. So, uh, and, and, and I think they're both important in a couple of different ways, but uh, I'm sorry I have so little to say about this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> stop me, stop me before I speak again. We've, we've, got, we've got lots of time, we'll come yeah, back. Please. <laughs> uh, so Chris, you, uh, you deal with things from a conservative point of view, I think it's uh, fair to say. Uh, what do you think about uh, the way the president has been talking about the press? And uh, do you, what do you think about the way the uh, press covers the president? I, um, I, feel like, I feel like I'm kind of do, about to do what Clarence said. I've got a lot to say on this <laughs> subject. Uh, but, I, but I agree with so much of actually what, what you just said, uh, Clarence, you know, one thing that has struck me is in all this uh, discussion of the, the looming autocracy is, as you say, this is not how autocracies work. When they're good, they really, there are constitutional crises. And I, I was walked over here from the hotel earlier, and I didn't see any smoke or, or fire in the streets, so I'm pretty sure that we're not in, in the midst of a constitutional crisis at the moment. The, um, there's a big difference, I will say, between press freedom and commendation of the press. Uh, those two things are not the same. Uh, what the press does, or what it ought to be doing, is, uh, is covering objectively, as, as well as it can. Uh, but we know that objectivity itself is, is in some ways uh, a myth. Right? We have, uh, the press is just composed of people. People have points of view, and that's okay. What we're doing is we're engaging in, uh, in politics uh, and trying to answer what is always the fundamental question of politics, which is who rules, 
right? And, uh, and as we address that question, people are going to uh, take different points of view. And so what I prefer uh, when I look at the press is I just like transparency. Uh, I look at the, the, the English press quite often, and I think, you know, in some ways, uh, they may be better served. You know, The Guardian uh, is a left-wing uh, social democratic slash socialist paper. I love The Guardian. I do not agree with their opinion page. Uh, but I think they do very good reporting, and I know where they're coming from. Uh, if you looked at that, you look at the Times of London or something, you know, sort of broadly Tory, uh, fine, okay. Uh, and, they, and they battle it out in, in print. I think that's the best that we can uh, hope for is a, a sort of transparency. We look back uh, at the press uh, of the past, basically in the post-World War II era, and there's this, uh, this longing I think people have for a bygone era that I'm not sure really existed, uh, where the press was this neutral arbiter sitting above politics, when in fact, Nobody's above politics. Everybody is engaged in it at some level. That's who we are uh, as human beings. Even when you get down to just story selection, why did we cover this and not that? That's a that is a, a political act. It's an act uh, of will. Why does I'll use the British again? Why does the Guardian cover one story and the Times cover a different story? And, and that's I think perfectly acceptable. People, I think uh, I, I want to give people a lot of credit. Your average person, going to what you were saying, Claire, uh, Clarence, it, people understand what's important to them. The Russia story is very important to people within about a 10 mile radius of where we're sitting right now. I live in Arizona. Nobody cares. Like coal country, you know what they care about? What are tariffs gonna do to jobs? Or what are other policies gonna do to jobs? Uh, did my kid get on the basketball team? Uh, you know, those are things that matter. Did, uh, was, was there some sort of process uh, uh, law broken by uh, so Paul Manafort. Are you, are you saying this isn't a story? Are you saying reporters shouldn't be investigating this? Which? Russia. The no, Russia go ahead story. and no investigate. I'm saying, uh, but it, it's a, it's a, I think it's a niche story. Uh, if there, if there are additional facts that come out from the Mueller investigation, that could change. But right now, what people are, uh, people outside of this area code care about are. What are the, what's the impact of tariffs? Uh, you know, what is the uh, impact of any of the other economic uh, policies that the, that the administration is pursuing? How does it affect me? Uh, what Paul Manafort did 12 years ago with the Ukraine, uh, I, <laughs> it, is, it is laughable how little people outside of uh, Washington care about that. And then you, and you get down to these issues, uh, which I think are basic political issues of um, you know, what's good for the country, what's good for me, how's it gonna, this gonna help me get ahead. This is why tax reform, I think, was, was a good idea. Uh, wouldn't have been my first policy choice, but. Okay, uh, I wanna get to sorry, the sorry. status, but uh, I'm sure, I, I, I can tell from expressions that people are gonna wanna challenge you a little bit on those points. <laughs> I figured uh, that's why I was here. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Hattis, you've covered uh, media and politics for quite a while. Uh, so what's your perspective on uh, where we are now, and, and uh, is this really nothing new, or is there something dangerous going on here? Well, I think as, as others have talked about that, the, we've kind of settled into a certain routine in terms of... Could you speak to the staff here? Sure. We have settled into sort of a more normal routine in terms of how we get coverage and that there are press briefings, as others have talked about here. Uh, and I wrote a piece before I joined CNN at Political Magazine called uh, The President's Fake War on the Fake News, talking to the point of how he talks a lot about how much he dislikes the media and all how they're the enemy of the American people, but if he really wanted to do something, he could block reporters from coming onto the White House grounds. They could stop the press briefings. He could tell his press office not to answer our questions, but that doesn't happen. When he decided to pull the health care bill, the first, news, the first people he called were from the New York Times and the Washington Post. He wasn't calling um, Breitbart. Uh, and I know from speaking to some people in the conservative media that they're a little bit miffed about that because they thought they would get all this access. And yet, you know that he still so deeply cares about how he is the president, how he is perceived um, by the national media. That is what he watches. That's what he reads every single morning. New York Post, New York Times, Washington Post. That's what he cares about. And obviously on television as well. So to that extent, um, I think to a lot of people's relief, we still have briefings, and as we are talking about, you're, you're, they're talking to the president a lot, and that's really great. And I know a lot of White House correspondents 
love the access they get. They love that they can call like 30 people in their phone list and they've, all those 30 people have just recently talked to the president and can tell them what he, what he told them and what he's thinking and things like that. Um, where the changes is, is the rhetoric in terms of, as Dan was talking about, how the general public feels about the media. I do think that for a long time people have always hated the media. I mean, you look back to the Crossfire days when Jon Stewart was you know, saying that the media was ruining our country because of a show like Crossfire. That's been going on for a long time. But I think when you look at the polling, there was a recent poll, I think, out of Monmouth University that said more and more people believe that the media purposely publishes fake news. And obviously, everybody has a different definition of fake news. Some people think fake news is biased news. Some people think fake news is literal fake things that people have made up. But that's a dangerous territory that we're entering into because, yes, uh, there are many different outlets that approach the news from different perspectives, but in moments of really important national stories, in moments of crisis, um, I do think that we've increasingly over the years, people have lost trust. And I personally feel a lot of that stems um, not just from people thinking that one side is biased versus the other, but honestly, if you look into it, the change at the local level, that we don't have the local newspapers we used to have before. And I do think that people feel a lot more trust when they understand, like you were saying, the transparency, who is behind the story. And right now, a lot of the national media is located in Washington, New York, or maybe LA, and the local outlets have seen a huge decline. And the same way that people say they hate Congress, but they like their member of Congress, people might hate the media, but they like their media. And I personally find that um, local media is where a lot of people begin the relationship with the media and where they have the most, the closest relationship, that's who's giving them their weather and their traffic and what's happening at the local school board. And when that starts disappearing, they see us as sort of these mysterious people who fly into their countries every, or fly into their states every now and then and, and talk to them for a few days and, and then go away and they don't trust us in the same way as they would trust somebody who lives and breathes and works in their community. And I, I think that's where part of the distrust stems from. The, uh, very interesting. And uh, you actually uh, teed up a, a question that I was uh, thinking of, which uh, has to do with the uh, Sinclair television stations which uh, uh, I'm sure uh, everybody here is familiar with the story that the, uh, Sinclair has uh, a pra owns 191 stations in the country, uh, markets large and small uh, all over the country, and they have a practice of uh, s sending their local stations mandatory uh, sometimes it's an editorial uh, that the stations are required to run. The most recent example was a mandatory commentary that was voiced by the uh, anchors of each local television station. And uh, Deadspin made a very clever mashup of it, which uh, got a lot of ridicule, but it also was uh, raised some serious questions. Now, television uh, editorials locally uh, have been something that's very, uh, that's been there since the beginning of uh, uh, television news. And, but they have usually been done by the general manager or by someone who's hired specifically to do editorials. The news anchors themselves have not uh, done this kind of commentary. And so uh, I guess uh, my question, maybe, uh, Major, I'll ask you first, since you're our television uh, representative here. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the president or the chairman of uh, Sinclair has pushed back very strongly and said that, uh, you know, this is uh, this was an important uh, message and something that uh, you know was quite within their rights to do. He compared this to the uh, late night TV comedy shows that. Uh, stations are obliged to carry as part of their network contract that, you know, that's must carry and, and that has a political edge. So what's wrong with this? So is there anything wrong with it? Does he have a point? Well, that's, first of all, for the audiences to decide. Second of all, um, in this question of fake, what the president calls fake news and other cabinet secretaries and now politicians all over the country try to label that, that's calling the question. And I'm all in favor of calling the question. What is it? What's journalism? What does it look like? Does it last? Is it credible? Does it ask the right questions? Does it probe and stay relentlessly on a story that's of public interest? I'm happy for that question to be called in whatever fashion. 
because I fundamentally believe, and I've built my entire career around it, and so has everyone on this stage, that credible journalism will always outlast incredible politicians, whoever that politician is. So I have no problem with the question being called and a national debate and a debate that begins around kitchen tables, what is journalism? Totally comfortable with that. Sinclair defends itself by saying, we're saying bad journalism is harmful. I agree. Bad journalism, reckless journalism is harmful. Define it and let the audience decide. But to Hadassah's point, when you have a declining emphasis on local journalism produced by local newspapers, and my first wife worked in local television. I worked at the newspaper in the city that we lived in. Trust me, the local television station got a lot of its content from the local newspaper, <laughs> all right? Well, when the local newspaper dies, or begins to die, the local television station begins to die because it doesn't have the resources to be at the school board. When the newspaper does, guess what the television station does? It reads about what happened at the school board and then decides what to do about it. But if it can't read the original story about the school board because nobody was there, then the local television station doesn't know what happened at the school board. Okay, and these things are very closely linked. And if there's something that is very important for this country to wrap its arms around the next 20 years, it's going to be what is the model of community journalism? When I was, long before I was in television, I worked for three newspapers in three different cities. Each city, to one degree or another, had a competitive newspaper environment. Amarillo, Texas, Las Vegas, Nevada, and Houston, Texas. Competitive newspaper envi environments almost don't exist anywhere in this country anymore. They barely have a single heavyweight newspaper anymore. <coughs> community journalism, that place within a community where people talk to each other, learn about each other, and cover community events and participate in that experience, either in covering it or learning about it or watching it, is an experience we're less and less familiar with than we were just 10 years ago. And in the era of Donald Trump, the New York Times has become a more fortified business model because it's got a relationship with its subscribers that's deeper and more abiding. The Washington Post has. The big corporations and the big newspapers have found themselves fortified in this stressful, high-octane, high-interest world. But local journalism hasn't. And the next great move in this conversation America has about what the First Amendment is, what are its rights, what are its responsibilities, and how does it interact with our daily lives will be played out much more importantly, I predict, in communities than it will in Washington, D.C., or New York City, or Los Angeles. Jump in. Um, <clears throat> as an addendum to this, uh, because I completely agree with Hadass and Major uh, on the component of the erosion of the connection in journalism in local communities feeding this distrust, um, the Correspondence Association this year undertook a real effort to get out into America and talk to Americans in their own communities about um, their hopes, their fears, their concerns, their questions about the White House, the administration, coverage of the White House journalism issues. And um, so part of the way we did this was to uh, begin a series of town halls at presidential libraries, which are all over the country. And uh, we have one coming up in May at the Reagan Library, if anyone's in Southern California in May, we'd love to see you there. Uh, but the first one that, that we did was uh, in Independence, Missouri um, at the Truman Library. And uh, piggybacked that with um, a quasi-related event a few weeks later in Kansas City uh, with American Public Square. And like a thousand people came out for that second event, several hundred for the first event. Um, there was spillover into outside rooms. People stayed afterwards to talk with us. It was like a Trump rally. <laughs> <laughs> Except for no one threw bottles at us. But. <laughs> uh, and I got a number of emails and one in-person follow-up visit in Washington from people who attended um, that session. And uh, we invited people to stay afterwards and talk to us if they couldn't get their question in. And the people who did stay afterwards to talk to us oftentimes wanted to talk about local issues in their own communities, not about Russia or Stormy Daniels or the omnibus bill or the tax plan, but something happening in their hometowns that they couldn't get anyone to pay attention to or that they felt that they couldn't get anyone um, to pay attention to. And that was incredibly instructive for me. So I do think like if there are a couple of lessons for us in this, um, and 
we can reopen this can of worms if we get there. I, I personally would not be eager to work for a news organization that stated uh, a partisan leaning or an ideological leaning. I um, uh, am and, and have always considered myself and consider myself now to be personally a completely unaffiliated voter. And uh, in terms of practice, uh, a, a, a newswoman, not an opinion uh, writer. Um, uh, but, uh, but I'll say there, I think there are lessons for us in uh, some of the challenges of the last <laughs> 15 months disguised as 10 years. And, uh, and one of those is the uh, erosion of a connection. People's feeling that they can, uh, that they understand who the media are, what the media is. Another really interesting thing that I learned from some polling that one of the jur uh, journalism advocacy groups did, I believe this is Reporters Committee, um, uh, for, for, I'm trying to remember which one, was it CPJ or was it RCPF? Anyway, uh, one of these great advocacy groups that we do a lot of partnering with uh, did some surveying and one thing that they learned which was amazing to me is that a lot of the public believes that uh, when you have a story with background sources, an anonymous source, that the source is anonymous to the reporter. <laughs> which was shocking to me because these are words that we trade in, so we just assume that everybody knows what it means when someone talks to you on background. Obviously, we know who we're talking to. <laughs> and uh, at all of our news organizations, we have a system. Well, we don't always know why they're talking to us, but we always know who they are. Uh, but you know, like at Bloomberg, we have a system. And, and if, there's, uh, we're, if we're using a background source, uh, two of our top editors need to know who, know who they are. This gets cleared up a chain of command. There are specific leadership positions at Bloomberg that decide whether to authorize this person as a source. We have a conversation about why they can't be on the record, about what their interests might be, about uh, whether there's another way to verify what they're saying. We almost always need at least two, three is better. So to, to go from what I, what's already baked into my head, what I already know about how this works, and to realize that there's any reader in America who thinks when they say, said a person who spoke on condition of anonymity, they thought that that meant that we didn't know who they were. It was like, well, God, no wonder nobody, you know, no wonder that person feels like they can't trust what they're reading. So I think it's important for all of us to take a step back and realize that, um, like we speak a weird special language that most people don't speak in, and that you can't be entirely transparent. Obviously, the source wouldn't be anonymous if you told everybody who the source was, but you can certainly have transparency about your process and be uh, and try to understand that uh, most sort of regular Americans who uh, who are among the group that feel that they have a sense of distrust about the media that that's coming from a place of um, frustration or disconnection or isolation or need, a, a need that they wish that we could fulfill that we are not helping them to fulfill. And that uh, rather than to see those people as just people who don't understand us, it's important to try to figure out how to reconnect with those right. people. They're the people who we need to reach the most. Peter, I'd, I'd like to ask you about this uh, question of trust. How? How do, does journalism rebuild trust with their audience? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. And I think, you know, Dan was exactly right to talk about the impact of uh, President Trump's attacks on our broader credibility. And, and, and that has created an environment in which people are more skeptical, more disconnected, or feel more disconnected from their media. They don't trust us as much. And I think, um, but part of this is our fault. I mean, like, the truth is we need to be, do a better job of explaining who we are and what we do, and, 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 and for all the reasons Margaret just said, you know, they, they think that our anonymous sources are anonymous to us. We did a study where we found that our readers, to our surprise, didn't understand that if we had a dateline, right, the, the reporter had the dateline say Moscow or London or, or Mexico City or Los Angeles, that the reporter was reporting from that place. Our readers didn't understand that. They just assumed we'd just put that city there because that's where the action was taking place, but that we're all sitting in New York or something like that. So we spent thousands and thousands of dollars to, to rush our reporters to get to the place so we actually see the thing we're reporting on, and our readers didn't even understand that that's what we're doing. So we do a terrible job of explaining ourselves. I think um, we've tried to do some things to counter that in the same way Margaret's talking about these town halls that, that, that she's talking about. The Times now, we do a story every day by one of our reporters about getting a story about how we got a particular story, how we came to write it, what we did to, to do it. Um, we, uh, we've allowed, uh, for the last year, cameras into our offices to do a, uh, a multi-part series that will air, I think, on Showtime in May about, about our coverage so that they can see reporters doing a little bit of what we do and why we make the decisions that we make, uh, which I think will be helpful. Um, and then there are things I think we need to think about. 
in terms of explaining the, the definitions that we all think we understand, but our readers and our viewers may not. So uh, Chris says every decision we make uh, on news judgment is political. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't agree with that, but I do think that there's no such thing as objectivity. But we blur the lines so much these days that it's not surprising our readers don't see the difference between a reporter, a news reporter, and a commentator, right? I'm on television this morning and I'm sitting next to people who are paid as Clarence is to have an opinion. I'm not paid to have an opinion. And so why should the viewer see me as something different than the person sitting next to me who's saying Trump is terrible, Trump is great? It's not my job to say that. I try not to say anything that would lend itself to that interpretation, but I'm sitting right next to somebody who does. And similarly on our websites these days. Or, or worse still, you're next to a political operative. Sure, and a, a player. Nobody can tell the difference. Exactly, a consultant, a player, player a strategist, a, yes. a commentator, a former this or a former that. And on our web page is the same. You know, we have our news stories are right next to our opinion columns, and it's not surprising. You know, there used to be a cleaner delineation, I think, you know, in the old days when we, <laughs> you know, but I think that's <laughs> actually page. true. We don't delineate as easily anymore. And then my last point on that is, Dan writes a lot of uh, analysis. I write a lot of analysis. I think that. Um, it's hard for us to explain, and we don't do a good job explaining the difference between what Dan does and what Clarence does, right? Between an, a, a, a news, news analysis. analysis and an opinion column. And they blend. There are a lot of the same elements to them sometimes, but they are meant to be different. And I, and I, uh, I think we do need to do a better job explaining ourselves. Yeah, good. Dan, I, I want to bring you into this. Uh, what do you think uh, should be done to try to raise the trust level, the credibility level? Well, I, th I think this is, this is not an easily solved problem, uh, in part because it is, it is reflective of a broader set of divisions within the country. And, um, you know, the credibility of the press has always been relatively low, but I think we're in a qualitatively different point, if not quantitatively. Um, I, I think a couple of things. One, I agree with Peter that we're not always as you know, smart as we ought to be about explaining why we do what we do and why we believe that what we do is important and to continue to try to do it in the way we've traditionally done it. Um, you know, Chris rightly points out that the British press has its ideology more open in the different news organizations and traditionally we have not done that. I think there is some, you know, evolution uh, on the part of the American media in that direction. I don't know that that's entirely healthy, and I still think that there is a role for, in essence, um, referees, if you will, if that's at all possible. And I think it's extremely difficult today, but I still think that there is some value in that. Whether that's an independent think tank or a, you know, or a news organization that does try to adhere to, a, we're, not, you know, we're not picking political sides in the way we, uh, we cover, obviously, Every day you make judgments about what you cover that, is, you know, as Chris says, have a, a political sensibility about it, although I think most of us in making those judgments are not making them for political reasons. And I think that's an important difference about the way the American media works as opposed to perhaps some other media. Um, I, 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 think that, um, I think that Twitter uh, is not our friend um, on a lot of these things um, because I think Twitter is a, is a platform that, um, if not encourages, uh, makes it possible for reporters to go farther in terms of uh, expressing things that look like opinion or are opinion uh, than good reporters ought to do. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's the nature of that, that medium, um, and I think reporters need to be more careful about that. Having said that, I think that, um, that the only way we regain trust is the quality of the reporting that we do uh, and the belief that over time the quality of that reporting will hold up. Um, you know, if, if we do our jobs the way we think we're doing them um, and are pursuing truth as best as we can get it, you know, hour by hour, day by day, month by month, uh, and we know that we don't get all of it uh, in the first, you know, in the first scrape of, of, the, of the event, but that if we continue to do that, and that if that is kind of our, you know, our goal, our mission, which is to continue to seek that uh, through, you know, through good, tough, hard reporting, um, then I think that over time, you know, our credibility could rise again. But I think that that will not happen uh, 
until there is a different political climate in the country, and I'm not predicting that that's going to happen anytime soon. And, and the cost of a mistake can be very high. Well, the cost of a mistake today is greater than it was probably in the past. I mean, because it, we're all on, we're all, you know, we're all on notice. We know that people will seize on that. Uh, we all make mistakes, and, and it, good news organizations do everything they can to correct those mistakes as quickly as they can. Um, but when we do make mistakes, and I don't mean the misspelling of a, you know, of a name, those, those things happen, and perhaps they happen more today because we are in such a rush to, to publish before we can fully edit. But I mean real mistakes, um, and we have to own up to those. But because when we make those now, they play into the idea that we are deliberately trying to distort the news. Um, I, I want to uh, go to one uh, last set of questions before we uh, turn to the audience for questions. And um, I want to talk about uh, President Trump's tweets about Amazon and his accusations that the uh, Washington Post is a lobbyist for Amazon. And Hadis, uh you and I were talking, and uh, you said you, this is part of a pattern with the president. Right. I mean, if you think about it, there's a bunch of real questions right now about companies getting really big and doing a lot that affect our lives. We're seeing a lot of, I'm covering right now every single day, the AT&T Time Warner, which is CNN's parent company, merger, antitrust merger case. Uh, Sinclair, we talked about earlier, buying the Tribune. There's FCC questions about how much, uh, how much a media company can own in a certain area. There's Amazon questions. I mean, look at Amazon. It's buying up a bunch of stuff that we do every day in our lives. Uh, 21st Century Fox is buying Disney. Those are, that's going to eliminate one of the big movie studios that we have. It's going to become part of the Disney studios. And there are legitimate questions about this that should be played out. We should be debating them. That's, that's not a problem. But what we have now is that they've become very much politicized, where the president has very clearly made comments that part of the reason that he does not like Amazon is because of the Washington Post, because Jeff Bezos, who owns Amazon, separately also owns the Washington Post. Washington Post is not part of Amazon. Yes, there are partnerships around them, but executives at Amazon have no power over what the Washington Post does. I can tell you that for a fact, uh, as Dan can as well. And, uh, but what we're seeing, though, is he tweets about it all the time. He was very public about the at t merger. He didn't want it to go through, and he's very public about what he thinks about CNN. We have not heard him say anything negative. Actually, he's only said positive things about Sinclair. I have not heard him say anything negative about 21st Century Fox and Disney's merger. So the issue here is that they become politicized. And so whether or not there are actual behind the scenes uh, nefarious directives being given out, it clouds a real debate we can be having about antitrust, about ownership, because we have this question. And so you have to wonder how the results then of all these various cases will play out and how much his comments about them will affect those decisions. And these are, I can't tell you how big these decisions are. These cases are going to determine a lot of our lives in terms of the media that we consume, how we consume it, how these companies interact. I mean. These sound very, I know, high level. They're, they can be, I sit in the courtroom every day, I can tell you they can be mind-numbing sometimes, the conversations that they're having, but they are incredibly important to the future of our country and the future of business in this country. Um, and, and that's a, a real issue that I know uh, when I talk to Wall Street analysts, when I talk to media analysts, they, it kind of feeds into this chaotic feeling that they are just, they just kind of aren't sure exactly which way this is going to go. And they're thinking in the future, media companies, might not want to buy another company because they might be fearful that the politicized nature of it will make it hard, hard for it to go through. Uh, and that's even more so because we have a president who is getting very, uh, making his voice very clearly heard about how he feels about certain issues and it tends to be, at least it gives the impression that it tends to be personal. Thank you. Dan, how is the Post reacting to uh, this lobbying charge? Well, um, we had a long story today by Mark Fisher on the front page of the print edition, and it's all over the home page, uh, about, in a sense, the two worlds of Donald Trump, a billionaire, and Jeff Bezos, a billionaire. And Donald Trump being a bricks and mortar kind of person, he's a builder, uh, he's an old fashioned person in that sense. Bezos obviously represents the whole digital push, uh, and the degree to which this is in part a cultural clash. <clears throat> and perhaps some, you know, envy between you know one billionaire versus another, and and uh, 
Bezos now, I guess, the richest person in the world, uh, and Trump having been reduced a little bit in the Forbes uh, hierarchy of billionaires. Um, I don't know how much of that is there. But um, that story quoted both Fred Ryan, our publisher, and, and, and Marty Barron, our editor, um, debunking, as, as Hada said, the, the idea that Jeff Bezos, in one way or another, is pulling the strings on how we cover the news. Um, you know, that's just not the case. He does not interfere with the news side, and as far as I know, he does not interfere on the editorial page. Um, and so he, he, has, he has done some very good things for the Washington Post, um, including spending a lot of money that's allowed us to hire a lot of reporters after a long period in which we had to reduce the size of our staff because, like every news organization, we were, you know, we were hemorrhaging money and, and therefore we had to uh, cut to, to try to stay within a budget. Uh, he's been very helpful on that front. He's been, he's been helpful in encouraging us to develop an engineering operation um, in, so that everything digitally works better and works faster and works smoothly. Um, so on all of those fronts, he has, he has been a positive force at the Post. But in terms of the way we cover the news, there's no indication from anybody I've talked to in the newsroom or felt personally uh, that something is being done because Jeff Bezos thinks it ought to be done and or that there's any political edge to why he owns the Washington Post. 